Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have a really fantastic uh, set of panelists here to discuss uh, the um, World of Wong Kar Wai retrospective. As I'm sure most of you know, uh, the films of Wong Kar Wai have recently been restored into this kind of beautiful uh, 4K version that is now being offered by Denver Film um, in at their uh, virtual uh, cinema. So if you haven't had a chance to check them out yet, please do. They're really incredible. They look gorgeous. And it's kind of a rare opportunity, honestly, to kind of be able to survey that is now being offered by Denver Film uh, um, in at their hold on one second, uh, me. virtual Sorry, I just put myself on mute because I was getting a, 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 an echo for whatever reason on my, on my phone, um, on my computer. Anyways, so uh, yes, yeah, so please do check those out. I should introduce myself. My name is Adam Graves. I'm the director of the Denver Project for Humanistic Inquiry or DeFi, which is the Public Humanities Center at MSU Denver, where I'm also a professor in the philosophy department and occasionally have uh, occasions to teach uh, courses on philosophy of film. So tonight, uh, we're going to begin with some brief kind of mini lectures by each of our uh, five distinguished panelists. Each of those will run for about five or six minutes. And then after that, we'll have an opportunity to uh, basically have a discussion with those of you who are uh, present with us. And so you'll, you'll see, I think, to your right, there should be a chat box that you can uh, submit your questions uh, kind of live or a, as we go. Um, and we'll get to those after the five presentations. So uh, thank you again for joining us. And of course, thanks to Denver Film, the C Film Center for hosting uh, this event. Um, so our first speaker tonight is David Desser, who's Emeritus Professor of Cinema Studies at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Urbana um, he's also adjunct professor at Cal, uh, Cal State uh, University, Northridge. So David, go ahead, take it away. Hey, hi, I'm, I am David Desser. Uh, and let me first give myself some street cred, as they say. Uh, I well remember when Chungking Express, the first of Wong Kar Wai's films uh, to show in the US was released in 1994. Uh, and the excitement I and many other devotees of Hong Kong cinema, uh, of which I had been a fan since the early 1970s, uh, experienced. But I can also say that while I would not pretend to understand every aspect uh, of uh, Chongqing Express or its follow-up Fallen Angels, I do believe my appreciation was immensely increased by the one and a half years I lived uh, in Hong Kong and taught film there. Uh, the many hours I spent uh, in the locations in which Wong shot made the films come alive in ways they had not before. So, it is no surprise to me that the two films most associated with Wong Kar Wai uh, are essentially about Hong Kong identity. Uh, the first was made just a few short years before the dreaded handover of 1997. And we still must never underestimate the shock and worry beginning in 1984 with the handover agreement to return Hong Kong to China. The second of his most important films was made just a few short years after the actual handover. Interestingly, another of his acclaimed films was made exactly in the years between the two films I will refer to, uh, made and released in the year of the handover, a film also about Hong Kong identity, uh, its characters already missing it in exile from the territory. Uh, a little preview, that film is Happy Together, and I want to acknowledge the fine work on this film by my fellow panelist, Helen Leung. Uh, the first of the two films I was referring to is Chungking Express, released in 1994, famously made in 23 days during a hiatus from filming Wong's difficult period song, sword film epic, Ashes of Time. Uh, Chungking Express is essentially about the loss of Hong Kong identity while at the same time trying to hold on to it. This is a notion of pre-post-colonial nostalgia. Cultural critic Akbar Abbas famously wrote about this in his hugely influential Hong Kong Culture and the Politics of Disappearance. In Chungking Express, Wong is insistent upon the spaces of Hong Kong that are unique 
even while within those spaces, the residents are transitory. In the first half of Chongqing Express, Wang shoots much of it in Chongqing mansions, a warren of interconnected hotel rooms with a great deal of retail, restaurants, and service shops on the first two floors. Uh, above that are hotels. Its location, just a handful of steps from the ferry terminal on Kowloon, and even fewer steps from the upscale Salisbury Road, right on the Nathan Road in the heart of Chimchachoy, right near the subway station, makes it an anomaly in the center of Hong Kong, an outpost of foreignness in the heart of a tourist trap. Chongqing Mansions is a place many, or perhaps most Hong Kong people never venture into. Fear, possibly racist, keeps them away from a place described on the internet movie database as a drug-filled, run-down hostel populated by Indians, Pakistanis, and Nepalese. Most tourists, too, never venture into the warren of hallways and tunnels, save for the money exchange easily visible from the street and the cheap souvenir shops in the alley on the north side of the main entrance. By casting Bridget Lin, the Taiwanese superstar of light romantic comedies in her home nation, and the butt-kicking martial arts superstar of the fabulous Hong Kong martial arts cinema, Wong takes advantage of this mysterious image. Meanwhile, across the bay in Central on Hong Kong Island, uh, if you've seen Chongqing Express, it's not clear, at least to me, whether the two stories the film tells are sequential or simultaneous. Bridget Lin and Fei Wong cross paths in the first part of the film, and Takeshi Kaneshiro and Tony Leung Chu Wai in the second. Uh, but anyway, in the, in the second part of the film, Tony Leung laments the breakup with his flight attendant girlfriend. Later, he will also lose the woman who has been crushing on him to trans globalism as well. In this section, the tourist area is at once clear, the escalators to the mid-levels, for instance, that people who have never been to Hong Kong cannot quite understand, or the Graham Street Market, but also faded away as many feared would Hong Kong itself, like Lan Kwai Fong's Midnight Express Cafe on Diagular Street. The second of Wong's most acclaimed films, the one that moved him from fanboy cult to art house snob sensation, was In the Mood for Love, released in the year 2000, described by my fellow panelist Yiman Wang as a sumptuous mood piece that depicts an enclave of Shanghainese emigres in 1960s Hong Kong. Professor Wong perceptively notes that this film possesses a double-layered nostalgia. Wong's memories of 60s Hong Kong and his parents' memories of old Shanghai before the Communist Revolution. In addition, my fellow panelist Joe Kikasola points out the waltzes in this film, nostalgic also then transnationally. <laughs> By the way, Hong Kong in the 1960s has proven a potent decade for nostalgic trips down memory lane for Hong Kongers. Films made between the handover announcement and the handover itself. Let me just mention two of my favorites. Uh, both the other Tony Leung, Leung Ka Fai, 92 legendary La Rose Noir, a hilarious tribute to Cantonese cinema of the 60s, uh, and He Ain't Heavy, He's My Father, a charming reworking of, and much superior to, Back to the Future, starring both Tony Leung's. <laughs> now, you would be forgiven if you thought that, given the centrality of the exploration of Hong Kong identity in these two films, and the proximity of the first to the handover and the post-handover proximity to the second, that these films would have been big hits in Hong Kong itself. First of all, Wong has never had a smash hit in Hong Kong. However, let us take Chungking Express, his breakthrough film in the US. In Hong Kong dollars, it grossed a respectable 7.7 .7 million. But let us compare it to the directorial debut of Stephen Chow from Beijing with Love. Chow's film grossed five times as much at 37.5 million Hong Kong. Oddly, Chungking Express did worse in Hong Kong than any of Wong's large handful of films except for Fallen Angel which grossed a few hundred thousand dollars less. 
As for his art house hit in the U.S., In the Mood for Love, while it grossed about a million more than Chung King, it was outgrossed to the tune of $1.1 million by Days of Being Wild, made a decade earlier. Now, Days of Being Wild constitutes the first part of what Yiman Wang calls Wang's 1960s trilogy. And while I think it is difficult for non-Hong Kong people, Days of Being Wild had no box office present in the US even after Chungking Express led to it being re-released. Star Leslie Chung is an icon in Hong Kong and his characterization probably resonates more than the rather minimalist depictions uh, of characters in the later film. Interestingly, uh, US critics have come to place Chungking Express happy together and in the mood for love as a kind of romantic trilogy a different trilogy then from the 1960s trilogy. But like Jean-Luc Goudard, to whom Wong was compared when Chungking Express was released, but rarely thereafter, Wong's films are all of a piece. One long film whose parts intersect in often surprising ways. And these surprises stay with one long after the films are over. Thank you very much, David. That was a really nice introduction to uh, uh, Wong Kar Wai's work. So um, our next speaker is um, Helen Long. She's professor and chair in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Um, and she's the co-director at the Institute for Trans-Pacific Cultural Research at Simon Fraser University in Canada. So Helen, take it over. Thank you. I want to thank Adam and the Denver Film Festival to, for organizing the event tonight and really getting together this really wonderful group. And I know we'll have a great conversation. Um, I want to speak about Wong Kar from kind of two perspectives. One, a little more personally as a Hong Konger and a film buff of a certain age. And second, a little bit more academically as a queer cinema studies scholar. Now, betraying my age a bit, I grew up in Hong Kong during the 1970s and 80s when Wong Kar was at that time working as a lowly paid screenwriter at TVB, which is a media company co-founded by mogul Run Run Shaw. The company's Cantonese channel of TVB Jade at that time was producing these wildly popular genre dramas. But amongst his writing and directing talents was Kam Kwok Leung, who later became a mentor to Wong Kar Wai. And at that time, he hired Wong to work with him, sometimes credited, sometimes uncredited, on some truly unorthodox TV series, which to this day so surprised me, but they found their way into primetime TV lineup. These series were kind of characterized by unexpected use of genre elements, um, absurdist, but also literary dialogues, a lot of experimental narrative structures and some truly daring themes. I think this experience of Wong working with making subversive content thematically and formally, but within a mainstream genre framework really set the tone for his later um, feature film debut. Um, David's already mentioned, you know, he made um, the first film he made as Tears Go By in 1989 and followed by Days of Being Wild in 1990. Now, these films are now kind of retrospectively watched as art house films, but when they came out in Hong Kong, the audience just saw them as genre films, a gangster film and a drama with a superstar ensemble cast. I think at that time, what the audience experienced was probably similar to how I felt when I watched those TV shows that Wang Kawai penned under Cam's mentorship. You expect them to be kind of trashy and fun, but then when you watch them, you're, you find them totally strange and maybe a little infuriating, but also completely enthralling and unforgettable. Days of Being Wild notoriously bankrupted its producers. Many of them were triad bosses, um, but the film also won every critical award in Hong Kong and still to this day tops many local Hong Kong critics films of the century list. So there's a kind of schizophrenia between the box office and mainstream and enjoyment and critical praise. When Ashes of Time came out after Wong formed his own production company, Jet Tone, the local reception was similarly controversial. The film again baited mainstream audience with its superstar cast and martial arts genre expectations, but then it mystified them with its long takes, philosophical dialogues, and impressionist fighting sequences, all of which the mainstream audience reportedly openly mocked during screenings at the time. Now, at the same time for university age kind of culture vulture viewers like myself, we felt as if we found our generational voice in Wong Kar Wai. 
A voice that has no pretension to high culture, a voice that shamelessly absorbs every influence from popular Chinese fiction to Latin American music to the French New Wave, a voice that seems to be earnestly philosophical, but also perversely pleasurable, and a voice that most of all is capable of infuriating, but also enthralling mainstream expectations. Now, after Ashes of Time, when Chongqing Express began to be embraced by Quentin Tarantino, uh, when David referred to seeing it in the States, and of course, later in the Mood for Love just took time by storm, and I think won the top prize. Um, from that point on, Wang Kawai became the international auteur that he is known as today. And unreasonably, I have to confess that I sometimes have nostalgia for the OG Wang Kawai before he was internationally discovered. I think perhaps I just missed the feeling that this weird and daring voice is our local little secret, a voice that belongs to and understood only by my generation in Hong Kong. I did remain a fan and I caught pretty much every Wang Kawai film made thereafter. But professionally, as a queer cinema studies scholar, I had not planned on writing much on Wang Kawai, except of course for Happy Together, which being one of the few Asian films during the 90s to feature not just same-sex love, but those of you who saw it, a pretty graphic opening sex scene. Most of us in queer Asian studies felt like we had to write an obligatory article or two about it. The film's initial reception amongst queer Asian studies scholars was actually kind of cool, if not a bit hostile. Even though I myself loved it, and you can tell from my virtual background, um, it also has personal resonance for me because it came out in 1997, the year of sovereignty transfer and arguably the origin of the city's continuing political turmoil today. Um, a few years ago, film scholar Martha Nonchunson was planning to edit a big volume on Wang Kawai for Blackwell. Um, she got in touch with me and said, hey, we don't have a queer perspective on Wang Kawai. Do you want to contribute a chapter? My first reaction was, but Wang Kawai films are full of straight characters. And so much has already been said about Happy Together, what's left for me to say. But at the same time, there was something really alluring about an invitation that would demand that I rewatch all of Wang's films with a different eye, a queer eye, if you will. So I said yes. Now, writing that piece has led me to discover something interesting, a kind of different experience of queerness, one that has nothing to do with same-sex desire per se. Um, rather, in that experience, I found what Akbar Abbas calls an erotic of disappointment in Wang's film, and which I paraphrase in my piece as an erotic investment in failure, very specifically the failure of heterosexual intimacy. It's a failure that triggers queer forms of erotic encounters, such as between a tailor and a dress that he's making for the women he desires in the hand, or the intimacy and ferocious combat between martial artists in The Grandmaster. The eroticism in these films hinges not on sexual fulfillment, but rather on what I call queer bonds, bonds whereby bodies and feelings are paradoxically connected through constraints and rest restrictions. I also found a queer dynamic in the earlier ensemble, which plays so much with characters displacing and substituting each other as objects of desire. I think this dynamic is present in almost every film from Days of Being Wild to 2046. And, and some of my colleagues here on the panel have written on similar uh, uh, related kind of themes in terms of substitution and displacement. I think these films unexpectedly remind me of bisexual and polyamorous critique of the couple as a structure of desire. These Wong Kawai films are erotic because the couple never gets together and the couple never works. And this failure of heterosexual coupling actually ignites and reroutes desire in all kinds of queer directions. So with that thought dangling, uh, I think I'll stop here and I look forward to chatting more in the conversation later. Thank you so much, Helen. That was really fascinating. Um, the erotics of disappointment. Uh, I'm going to remember that. So, um, all right. Our next speaker is Joseph Kikasola, who's a professor of film and digital media and director of Baylor in New York, the Baylor in New York program at uh, Baylor University, but in New York. So, uh, Joseph, go ahead. Oh, uh, but you're on mute. <laughs> Yeah, I'm back. Um, 
thanks so much, Adam. I really appreciate the invitation here. And I'm so excited that this institution is providing this opportunity to, for uh, people perhaps to discover Wong's work for the first time. Uh, he is truly a great artist. And that's what I want to talk about in, in my little bit here is there, he's a multi-dimensional talent. There are many, many things that we can talk about and will talk about. That's why there's so many brilliant minds here talking about many different kinds of things. I want to focus on craft. When, when I teach film students, students who want to be film directors, producers, cinematographers, who do I show them? Well, Wong is somebody I always show. And one of the things I emphasize is how Wong acts sort of like a conductor in a symphony. And he's really shaping an overarching experience of flow, which is a very difficult thing to pin down. But basically, it's kind of an aggregate set of forces. It's like all the things that capture our attention and that push us and pull us in terms of our experience of time and expectation within the present moment. So I'm going to take you just through a one minute scene. I can't show you the scene uh, for copyright reasons and for time purposes, but I, I'll walk you through it. And I'm assuming you can see my screen here. This is from In the Mood for Love. The, um, the opening title card of the, of the movie starts with this poem here. It is a restless moment. She's kept her head lowered to give him a chance to come closer, but he could not for lack of courage. She turns and walks away. There's a wonderful rhythm to that that I'm probably losing by reading too fast, but there is a pattern or a rhythm and there's an internal pressure of time even within that poem. There's a standing quality, a static quality and a moving quality at the same time. It's that paradox that is absolutely true and invigorating. And that's what he's trying to capture. That sets up kind of um, a temporal theme for the entire film. And it's an experience that he will try to capture again and again and again through uh, formal means, through the way he shapes and moves the tools of cinema. So an interviewer was once asked him about how he was writing scripts while he was shooting and he was editing while he was shooting. These are all very unorthodox methods. And, and particularly in In the Mood for Love, he shot miles and miles and miles of footage that he never used. And he was, it, he nearly drove his actors and his cinematographer crazy because of the spontaneity and his insistence that he do it there in the moment. And that's part of the, the thing is the moment. And uh, he kept saying, is this the right rhythm or not? That's what he, his quest was to find the right rhythm for a scene. Now, of course, plot matters, <laughs> right? I'm not trying to say none of that stuff matters, but this is what we're focusing on here. How does he shape the flow of a scene? There's a little one minute scene. This is the first uh, incidence of what we call waltz on the soundtrack. It's a wonderful soundtrack, by the way. And, it, and it's in a three rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. It's actually one, two, three, four, five, six. It's in six, eight rhythm, I believe. And um, it starts with a woman carrying in a, a pack of cigarettes. That is Sue carrying cigarettes to her husband. You see it moving across the, the scene. Uh, she sits down next to her husband in an, in an adjoining room. The next thing that happens is another woman enters the scene. Sue stands up to greet her. That woman passes between her and her husband, which is very significant. And, and then uh, that's about halfway through this one minute scene. She's left standing in the doorway. And then a man appears, which we know from earlier in the movie is her neighbor, Chow. So we have two couples, actually. We have Sue and her husband. And then we have the woman who entered, uh, which is who is actually uh, Mrs. Chow. And as soon as Mrs. Chow shows up, Mr. Chow decides it's time to leave. And so that's also interesting. And nothing is said in this scene. And it's early in the film. So already we can see some plot developments happening and we follow Chow out through the room and the camera sort of lingers on the empty doorway after he leaves for a moment. And, um, and then we cut, first cut in the scene to a little tableau of, of um, Sue with her husband where she, he reaches up and touches her hand. She uh, is obviously pleased by that and looks at him and smiles and then her head comes back down as the camera is very gently pulling away and the scene fades out. Now that seems like a very simple kind of symmetrical scene. A man, a, a woman enters the scene, we see a tableau and a man leaves and it kind of closes it out with a tableau and it's beautiful. But I'm thinking to myself, I think this is the perfect scene. Why is this the perfect scene? It feels like a perfectly cut diamond or something, you know? So when we go in to analyze this, how do I, how do I assess this? Um, this is it running through. 
I started counting musical measures and I discovered that this scene is exactly 40 measures of music in six, eight time, exactly 40 measures. That was an interesting even number to me. And um, so then I started thinking, okay, well there's pauses, there's pauses in the scene that are really important. It starts in black and then we get to a pause where she sits down next to her husband, beat. Then we have a, the, the other woman enters and she's left alone in the doorway, beat. And then we have the man leaves, empty doorway beat. And then we have the tableau at the end, which, which is a beat. And wouldn't you know that these beats happen exactly at measure zero, measure 10, measure 20, measure 30, and measure 40. So the precision of his timing is absolutely extraordinary. When you consider he was doing this almost completely in one take in the moment while he was filming. You see, now it is, it's shot in slow motion, but that actually complicates things rather than, uh, rather than simplifying them. In between, you have energy and motion going on. There's all kinds of things going on here that I don't have time to totally get into, but notice how her dress is a, a swirling kind of organic, lively pattern. It's contrasting with these very rigid straight lines through the doorway, right? Uh, really, really fascinating contrast. And her hips are swaying as she moves. And she is a lively form going into kind of a staid structure. And that is also important. And, and it, it gathers our attention. Um, she sits down, of course. And then the other woman enters at, at 10. And then she stands up. And they have to squeeze past each other in the doorway. And as the other woman comes between her and her husband, she drags her hand across the back of his chair and perhaps across his back and that's also significant and you see a standing fan there whirling on the right that is a, that is an energy lift essentially the floor of energy has been raised in the scene so now we have a static moment but that's that standing streaming character you have a static scene that also has energy that has been ramped up by you know double now and so then we're left with that tableau and then um then uh, the man moves through. And notice right before he leaves, we get a little burst of color in this green vase that, ca that we see passing through the camera. Now, all of this is deliberate. They had art direction, everything. Nothing's in the frame by accident. And so that burst of green color sustains our energy right to that last pause where we will linger on the door for a moment. So I don't have a lot of time to get into all of the reasons why this, this gathers our attention and moves us, but what we see is a careful shaping of the energy in this scene. And by energy, I mean all the energies involved. We're talking about character psychology, we're talking about color and visual forms, and we're talking about time pressures and um, the way he is using different moving forms in the scene to shape something that builds, builds, and builds to a kind of climax that ends with this really interesting tableau of perfect love that we already know is not perfect. And so that's a great way to tell a story without any words in a one minute scene. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joe. That was a really interesting uh... Uh, kind of careful analysis. We, we in these panels, we've been kind of talking about things in kind of from thirty thousand feet. So it's it's really kind of fun to just take one uh, one short scene, relatively short scene, and, and analyze it like that. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Iman Wang. Uh, she's professor of film and digital media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Thank you, Adam, and thanks for, to Denver Film for bringing us together. And I'm so much enjoying the discussion that has already happened. I'm a little bit at loss as to what I can contribute at this point. But I guess uh, in some ways to follow the example of Helen, I'm also going to start out by speaking a little bit about my experience with Wong Kar Wai's films in the long durée kind of uh, mode. Not as long as Helen's, uh, because you know I my background is mainland China, so the exposure, my exposure to Wong Kar Wai's films was not in real time. It was a little lagging behind. And, and then uh, after that, I want to also speak a little bit about my uh, I guess my uh, sort of like uh, the uh, understanding of the post-colonial pitch of Wong Kar Wai's films. So first of all, I became exposed to Wong Kar Wai's films in grad school at Duke University. 
And at that point, the first film that I saw was In the Mood for Love. And obviously, it blew me away. And, and then from that point on, I sort of both retraced to his earlier films and also as Wong Kar Wai's uh, body of work also keep growing, I sort of went in both directions, retracing and also following up with Wong Kar Wai's new works. And so in other words, when I started out watching those films uh, and then what, uh, going back to watch As Tears Go By and Days of Being Wild, it was this very specific moment where, uh, you know, the characters are older than me. And I I looked to them and uh, it was not something that spoke to me immediately. Um, in the mood for love and then afterwards, those are the films that I really adore. And then after that graduate school period, uh, Wong Kar Wai's films became extremely poignant and I became obsessively interested in them for the specific reason that I was on the job market for a couple of years and sort of doing postdocs and back and forth. And so every year I was looking at my contract, the expiration date is June 30th, you know, of that year. So the whole idea of uh, the temporality, the anxiety that uh, exudes from Wong Kar Wai's films from uh, uh, days of being wired on, you know, all the obsessive uh, gaze at the clock faces, right? And all the uh, notions of how the expiration dates are drawing, drawing near, you got to do something and all of that. So Wong Kar Wai's films became my obsession during that period. And after that, uh, I, I, I wrote about uh, his films and I taught his films. And then, of course, now with this specific uh, occasion, Wong Kar Wai's films are being restored into the 4K spectacular uh, representation. And unfortunately, we have to just watch these films on our small screen instead of in theater at this point. But now, um, when I'm watching As Tears Go By again, it's like a time capsule. Now I'm older than those characters. Those, those characters and even the actors seem to stay in that specific time frame and become so beautifully encapsulated in the vehicle, in the film vehicle. And uh, I revisit visit these films as if I were meeting up with my old friends again. So it's a very different kind of interaction that I'm experiencing now, you know, through this kind of long historical durée. Um, and I'm still, uh, that's, that's kind of surprising to me, but I need to uh, brood on that. So I guess in some ways, uh, I also want to use that to segue to, uh, segue to my interest in the craft, but also a specific a formal aspect of Wong Kar Wai's films. And to echo what David uh, said earlier, that Wong Kar Wai's films, all of them sort of conjugate with each other into this long piece of film. And that's that kind of uh, serial format is, is, is exactly what I'm interested in, in thinking about Wong Kar Wai's films. Um, the ser seriality, the serial form that uh, in my article in the volume, I actually think of that as a a uh, formal articulation of the post-colonial sentiment, sentiment. Because if we think about post-colonial, it is never post. It is actually, you know, always now, right? So what is before the uh, post-colonial is pre, and then it uh, and then it's post. But it's really always now. So it is uh, the feeling of seriality and the something that happened. Uh, sort of at the origin point, but then that origin point is permanently lost. So what we have left, which is what we see, my understanding in Wong Kar Wai's films is um, the serial after effects or sequela. So it's this kind of serial after after a fact that we are constantly living through and reliving uh, through. Uh, so I'm kind of thinking of serial format in relation to sequela as a way of understanding the post-colonial sentiment and post-colonial affective politics as always being now and how this kind of seriality, this form of seriality is also articulated in Wong Kar Wai's films through the kind of spatial seriality, you know, from Shanghai, his own personal background to Hong Kong. And then in each one of his films, there's always a sense of life is elsewhere. It could be just a very elliptic, 
uh, shot of a palm tree kind of swing in the middle in the mid air, but then it really posits another place, the next step of the serial. But then in some ways to ha uh, to echo Helen says, the, you know, the erotics of disappointment, the life is elsewhere always flips back into that elsewhere is also not an ideal place. There's always, always the disappointment at every step of the serial. In some ways, you know, a, watching these films um, feels like a hangover. It's, you know, something happened. And, you know, you're dealing with after effect. And the after effect is something that's so effectively enveloping that uh, there is no way of getting out of it. And you don't want to get out of it in some ways. So that's sort of like my overall rumination on Wong Kar Wai's films, my, my own experience with them. Thank you so much, Iman. It's, it's nice. It's actually kind of... Uh, uh, well, it's just nice to hear a scholar talk about it from such a personal perspective and so candidly. So I really appreciate your uh, your comments. So our last speaker uh, for this evening is uh, Giorgio Bianca Bianca Rosso, who's professor of music and uh, director at the Society of Fellows in the Humanities at the University of Hong Kong. So, Giorgio, go ahead. Uh, except take yourself off. Yeah, you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's thrilling to be in such a distinguished company. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to share a uh, screen. Uh, my uh, uh, my job uh, today is to maybe I'll try and contextualize the, the, the box set, the new box set, the World of Wong Kar Wai, the Criterion and Janus have, have, have brought out. And I'd like to begin with the brochure that comes with the, with the box set. And in particular, a fun fact featured uh, in the very last page, which reads, Wong Kar Wai's feature debut, As Tears Go By, remained his highest grossing film in Hong Kong until the release of The Grandmaster in 2013. Condensed here, uh, in a sense, is the history of Wong Kar Wai's conflicted relationship with the Hong Kong audience over a 25 year period. A missed encounter, one might call it. Uh, its status as factoid notwithstanding, this piece of information is an important reminder of how from the very start, Wong must have been aware that he had to bypass Hong Kong in order to find a large enough audience that would support his artistic ambitions and make his endeavors financially viable. Hence his appeal, not only to the communities of Chinese migrants overseas and their distribution networks, as was customary for any self-respecting Hong Kong filmmaker at the time, but also the global and transnational community of cinephiles via film festival participations, including Denver's, uh, in fact, Denver's own, and international distribution, strategy that paid off, especially in such places as Taiwan, Japan, and, and France. Tarantino's championing of Chunking Express through his short-lived DVD specialty label, Rolling Thunder, opened up further opportunities in the theatrical release circuit for Wong's subsequent films. As David Desser uh, has shown, among others, uh, Tarantino's tutelage was something of a mixed blessing. Uh, the lesson was not lost on Wong, however. Alongside the penetration into traditional distribution channels, Wong has long sought to expand the presence of his films in the mediascape through increasingly curated DVDs, including significantly another version of Chunking Express with a revamped soundtrack in 2008, soundtrack releases, such as this deluxe vinyl edition of the soundtrack of Chunking Express that came out on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of Jet Tone, and specially designed merchandise. This effort is in keeping with Wong's desire to subsume his films under a large entity that transcends it, part Wagnerian cycle, part serialized novel, and part late 20th century franchise. Wong's penchant for the cyclical form is both explicit in the 1960s uh, themed trilogy and implicit. Think of his casting and choice of collaborators, both of which impart continuity across films that are otherwise distinct as pertains to characterization and setting. Which brings me to Wong's collaboration uh, with Janos Films and, and, and the box set we're here to celebrate in a sense today. Taking a page from the recording industry, Criterion and Wong are to an extent following a commercial imperative. And this is the box set 
uh, the war of one Karawai. This is actually a, 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 an interesting analogy, the Maria Callas remastered complete studio recordings that came out in 2014. So I'm drawing an analogy here. Um, so there's a commercial imperative, obviously, but it is the aesthetic implications of the enterprise I'm interested uh, in touching on today. For the world of Wong Kar Wai is symptomatic of an approach that hinges on the attempt to not only control the creative process and assert ownership of the work, but also shape its reception. For this reason, and while I do not wish to minimize the need and desirability of restoring and polishing the existing footage, I propose that we think and we refer to this release as an addition as much as a restoration. The active, deliberate editorializing of a given body of work according to a given set of premises, an agenda of sorts. An edition is prospective as much as retrospective. It offers a template for use, a context in which all films are put in dialogue with one another. It functions as a standard bearer against which other iterations of Wong's films, whether different in cut, aspect ratio, or context of presentation will be evaluated. An interesting prospect to be sure, considering that to make an example, Fallen Angels is being released here in a different aspect ratio to the original release, or that the hand is four minutes longer than it was as part of Eros, the omnibus film from which it has now been disentangled in a clear attempt to cast it as a standalone feature. A digital edition is a form of preservation too, both recuperative, as in the case of Happy Together, which was damaged, and preemptive, an insurance of sorts against the threat of decay and worse loss. As permanently encoded digital objects, these seven films are now in the position to survive all manner of physical hazards gloriously intact. But it isn't just material preservation that Wong Kar Wai is after. Having more or less improvised his way through the usually protracted production process and miraculously landed at the 11th hour on something akin to a final version for the sake of, say, a festival screening. Wong has come to view and eventually defend uh, the final product of his labor as the crystallization of a deliberate, deeply personal trajectory. And as well he might, given the vagaries of film distribution and the need to establish a direct line of communication with an ever-shifting mercurial audience. Aware that a filmmaker's work is copied, cut up, cited, sampled, remixed, parodied in all manner of formats, one wants us to know that there is a place we can go back to where the work is enshrined and as such retains its integrity. I doubt he will succeed in this effort, but that does not mean it will not have been worth it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giorgio. Really appreciate that. You know, you're the second uh, panelist. We had someone last week who also commented on uh, uh, Wong Kar Wai's kind of playing with the, the this this new edition and and the changes um, and kind of tracking that what changes were made and and speculating about why um, I, I just I want to just open first I want to say that the panelists you you should all have an opportunity to ask each other questions so you know let the you know get your thought collect your thoughts while I pose this question to you um, as we wait for the audience to uh, send in some questions as well. But I'm curious, did Wong Kar Wai, um, I, I gather that he's you know, an incredibly independent filmmaker, unlike many directors who don't have control over the final cut of their films, did he have, did, do we know whether he had he had final cut over most of his early films, say the ones from the, from the early, late 80s, early 90s? Um, if, if not, uh, then of course it would make sense why he would want to go back if he did then let's speculate a little bit about what what his um, motivations may be for ch making the changes that he's made. It's about resources. He didn't. He felt that he didn't have enough resources to do it the way he wanted to, but he had final cut. He had the right to cut it. So, so you mean when you say about resources, he had now he has resource. He had resources to kind of to kind of reevaluate the the yeah. Fiddle, he, fiddle with it, which is, of course, very dangerous. I'm thinking about Robert Schumann's late edition of his own works. No one likes them. Everyone prefers the original. And many people prefer, of course, the original Ashes of Time to the, to the Redux. But to make an, an example, that, which I think will resonate, um, he re rescored uh, the, the music for Ashes of Time with the, with, the, with the live orchestra because he felt that the synthesizer score with which the original 94 release came out with was sounded cheap. And 
he had a synthesizer score because he didn't have money and time to actually have a you know uh, an actual score so uh, i think that's the that's one more that's one motivation for uh, for it that's really interesting um, yeah, so panelists, I, I open the open the floor to anyone to pose any question to to ourselves. And um, also, Keith, I should ask if you uh, if you have any questions coming in from the audience, you're welcome to kind of chime in as well. Well, let me pose another question of my own, just because I just got done last night watching the uh, the restoration slash new edition of In the Mood for Love. I hadn't seen it, to be honest, since I suppose 2000 when I saw it in the theaters and absolutely loved it and remembered. I was actually surprised. This is, I think this is, um, I, I don't have a memory of this sort. I know a lot of film scholars do, uh, where where I you know will remember very specific details of, of shots even 20 years later. But when it comes to Wong Kar Wai, especially perhaps In the Mood for Love, it's just such a visually beautiful film. Um, I, there were numerous occasions throughout the watching where I was like, wow, you know, I remember exactly how this woman in the dress is framed by the window. Um, and uh, anyways, it was a really cool experience. But I'm, I'm, I have a couple of questions about it. Um, <laughs> I'm curious if you guys have thought about this. Uh, these are kind of ob these, in some sense, obvious questions that would occur to anybody who views the film. You know, one thing that's, I think, interesting about it is it's about two couples, right? Uh, but we never see the face of two uh, two members of of that of of the couple of couples, right? We never see the faces of the uh, husband and wife who are having the affair. Um, has has, has Wong Kar Wai commented on this? Has anyone written about it or thought about it? You know, is this just a matter of 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 trying to establish conditions uh, conditions under which the the two main characters can be more you know, sympathetic, as it were, um, because we don't know who it is that they are in some sense double crossing, I guess. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ina. They, uh, the footage was actually shot with the other, with the, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, the, the couple, you were saying the husband and wife who were having an affair, they actually had uh, visual footage and the original cut of the film was uh, uh, an hour, was 130 minutes, I think. Uh, and then it was reduced to something like 90 minutes. So lots of the footage were edited out of the version that we are seeing now. And in the DVD, uh, uh, set there there's actually bonus material that shows alternative cuts and I watched those and to be honest I think the version that we are seeing now is the perfect vision uh, I mean the perfect version and vision as opposed to you know the long the more uh, explicit or tell all show all kind of approach that just does not work interesting Yes, go ahead, Helen. Uh, I, think, I, I think another kind of interesting um, tidbit about, and I agree with Iman that I, I prefer not seeing them. Um, one of the kind of interesting references is that the film was loosely inspired by a Hong Kong novella called, translated as Intersection, but that novella the, um, really referred to Tet Besh, you know, the kind of stamp, that kind of in, the inverse image of stamps that mirror each other. And so I think that's a very kind of, vague allusion to the fact that the two couples are like you know inverse mirror of each other um that it's not so much about just you know cheating and anxiety about cheating that in fact what they are doing become the kind of inversion of the other spouse so i think it's more intriguing to not see the spouse's face because they then become kind of ghostly echo of the, the two protagonists. Um, so I think that works very well. Um, yeah, exactly. Especially since they they reenact um, mm -hmm. and try to kind of imagine what what their uh, respective spouses did, how they approached one another, and they and and I suppose those reenactments in sense in some sense would lose some of their magic if we in fact knew those characters better. Um, uh, it looked like you wanted to say you wanted to jump in, Joe. Well, I think you've hit on it. For for me, it's um, the, the story is it's it's a romantic tragedy, you know, and it it really amplifies the effect of you know 
when you don't, what, you, what you're saying to yourself throughout the whole film is, why can't they just get together, <laughs> right? You know, why can't they just make this happen? Well, the answer to that is there are, there are human beings <laughs> to whom they are attached, right? But if you don't see those human beings, you're constantly having to treat them as abstractions and, you know, and, and so it greatly intensifies. I mean, for me, I, it was, you know, I, I'm very much about, about fidelity, right? Um, and these people made commitments to other people. And what does that mean, even if the other people are cheating and stuff? But you get that gets placed in the realm of abstraction when you're in the living, breathing uh, present, you know? Um, and so to me, it was a, it was a brilliant, dramatic choice um, that, because uh, you can't, it, it's very, it puts the onus on you to imagine the obstacles and, and then tell yourself that those are right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It, quite a study in uh, the erotics of disappointment. <laughs> there is also, I, mean, there is also, I think uh, the film places itself in a tradition of um, longstanding tradition within uh, um, um, Mandarin language cinema of didactic uh, melodramas. Um, didactic in the sense that they are meant to um, display uh, models of behavior. Uh, so the Wong may not espouse, necessarily embrace uh, uh, those values anymore himself. I think he felt that, you know, um, 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 especially given the setting of the film and the films uh, which are more or less obliquely referred to in the course of, in the mode love, that he, he had to, as it were, um, um, abide by that code uh, that you don't show certain things. So to show the the spouses would have meant to show, you know, um, a more graphic or at least more uh, more literal um, um, romantic uh, embrace, which you know was not in line with the uh, with the with the codes of the time and um, and the aesthetics uh, Wong wished to revive. Um, through, through in the motor in the law, yeah. And of course, I think the viewers rooting, as as Joe mentioned, you know, we're kind of we 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 understand the code uh, because because we understand why the the couple the the, the, the two main characters are um, uh, are are ups, you know angered, upset, and and why their kind of relationship kind of occurs in the in the first place. Um, but but it also obviously questions the code and it, and you you as a viewer realize the kind of the 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 vacuity or there's something like the the superficiality of the code you know when when the woman turns to um tony long's character and says you know but we won't be like them of course he's i think that that's incredibly disappointing to him and it's also disappointing <laughs> to the audience right um we're like you mentioned you know we're, we're rooting for them to get together i suppose that's I, that's why i think it's a tragedy as joe rightly said was that's that you know that divided and that's the yeah. seed of tragedy yeah. yeah you see from both sides at the same time and it's really um there's this kind of irreconcilability but, but i think maybe to slightly disagree in terms of the the tragic aspect of it because for what i see is like the tragedy is the erotic in Wang Kao Wai Wei and, and, and in this film as well. I mean, if they get together, I think then it's no longer a Wang Kao Wai film. And so the, the, it seems to me the erotic drive is exactly that they don't. And then and they're kind of constrained by either the code or whatever. I mean, I read it as they actually get off on <laughs> this, you know, jealousy of the other. And so the very drive of the films, they really cannot get together. Um, it wouldn't work that way. Uh, it won't be Wang Kawai anymore. Um, so I find it, it you know, interestingly perverse <laughs> that, that you know, you, you're, as an audience, it really disrupt the kind of romance genre and, and really disrupt the kind of melodrama that maybe it's, it's citing, but really subverting it. Um, that seems to me so, it, he repeat, and he repeats it, right? He, he does it over and over in all of the film. Um, Iman, go ahead. Yeah, I want to echo uh, Helen's, uh, you know, kind of like perverse, but really, I don't think I don't think it's uh, I think that's what makes it work for 
audience on the subliminal level, even if the audience might vote explicitly that, you know, people who are in love with each other should be together. But then if it's really that kind of pat kind of conclusion, then the film will just become one of those run run of the mill kind of romantic comedy or whatever, right? So what I really appreciate about uh, his films is precisely, I mean, Helen, Helen mentioned earlier, the erotics of disappointment, but I think ultimately it is about desire, right? All of these films is about desire for a connection. It could be romantic connection. It could be just, uh, you know, any kind of sociality. It doesn't need to be romantic, but it's about the kind of this kind of desire. And that desire in some ways, philosophically speaking, right? can never be gratified uh, to the uh, to the complete extent. It, it is always something that's titillated. And then all of these films, I think, are uh, the ways of posturing, gesturing, rehearsing, and enacting possible ways of speaking, addressing those kind of desires. But, you know, it's always, the desire is not going to be gratified, uh, right? Because, you know, one one trope that I see a, a recurring in Wong Kar Wai's films is a physical ha- inhabitation of another person's space, right? Mm-hmm. In multiple On multiple levels. So in the mood for love, we see when this couple, Tony Leon and Maggie Chung, are dining in the restaurant, then they all of a sudden get the idea of, you know, they try the other couple's the, the other person's partner's favorite dish, right? So in terms of this kind of culinary, they try to occupy the other person's position. And then uh, when Tony Leung's character moves to Singapore, Maggie Chong's character actually follows there, but instead of meeting each other, which may be what the audience would vote for, she just sneaks into his space and inhabits his space and tries on the slippers you know, that he has brought with him to Singapore. And then in Chongqing Express, you see that again, the way that Fei Wong uh, is able or tries to uh, alleviate his her own desire or curiosity or desire is to invade the cop's space, right? So there is this kind of very interesting kind of uh, uh, a theatrical aspect, even though a lot of these films are so tuned down, but they're actually highly emotionally, affectively theatrical in the sense that these characters' uh, ways of uh, articulating their desires is to imagine ways of taking over the other person's space or taste or just habitat, right? And and so I think it's uh, all of this, it goes to say that it's really more about heterosexual coupling, I think. Yeah, I love, that's such a great point about inhabiting, desire as inhabiting the other space. And my favorite and most absurd one probably was in Fallen Angels, when Michelle Ray's character basically clean up yeah. uh, Leon Lai's room and pick up his rubbish and, and you know, looking at, the, and then masturbating in her own room to that. So, um, yeah, so that it, it's, but I like, like it that there's also black humor in some of it as well. It's not always kind of romantic and tragic, but but yeah, that is a great way of describing how Wong Kawai approaches desire. And I think that, there's almost, uh, okay. oh, sorry. Yeah, I was. I agree a hundred percent with both Helen. Actually, leaped into my point. Oh, about the, sorry. Oh, no, it's great. No, but it also made me think about the other character in Fallen Angels. You talk about inhabiting space. Look what Takeshi Kaneshiro does uh, in terms of his nighttime activities, so to speak. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's a wonderful point. But I was also thinking that Iman's point about if if relationships are consummated, then what do you have? It's like, okay, but if they're not, I mean, it almost seems arbitrary when Fei Wong leaves at the end of <laughs> Chongqing Express. I mean, all that time she's gone after Tony Leung, but now she just leaves. But what else would you want? I mean, what else could it be? They, they get married and live happily ever after? <laughs> I mean, that, you know, so Yuman's absolutely right. I mean, what, what else could it be but an ordinary rom-com uh, unless, it's, uh, unless desire is thwarted? In which case, you don't have, I think, a tragedy so much as an old-fashioned romance 
like a medieval romance, <laughs> which is never consummated. Which is kind of, which is also like to say no romance at all, right? In some in some sort of so this idea that that the desire itself is nurtured by the lack of gratification, so connected to this occupying of space. I'm thinking of um, in uh, Chunking Express when the character. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget all of the characters' names, but when she's cleaning the apartment of the of the police officer, um, and she's obviously having, she becomes obsessive, occupying the, you know, not just cleaning it, but changing things out, objects out and whatnot. And um, at a certain later point in the film, if I'm not mistaken, if I recall correctly, she's then invited to occupy the, the apartment. I mean, that is to say the man's kind of like, oh, come on and hang out with me here. And that, it changes everything. She doesn't, she no longer wants to be in the real space of the apartment. She wants to be in the fantasy space of the apartment, occupying the position of um, maybe the the ex girlfriend or or something like that. But the the actual gratification, the actual you know, once the relationship is consummated, it's over. It's you know, once the Messiah has come, what they're to wait for, you know, um, that sort of thing. Of course, the driving factor here is the is the spectator. I mean, it's all about the spectator. Right, so uh, there's an almost Hitchcockian kind of cruelty in a sense that that uh, uh, almost everything becomes a plot to inflict something onto us, uh, or you know, uh, enhance or heighten our desire uh, or disappoint it, so that we move, we continue to you know uh, to move forward and look forward to to more. So it's a very interesting relationship that these disappointments establish with the uh, with with the spectator uh, themselves. Who are the only real people in the room anyway, right? I do have a question for my fellow panelists. Um, because I'm curious about uh local versus international reception. And as I say, I think Days of Being Wild remains a local Hong Kong film critics kind of darling. It really tops a lot of film lists. Um, but then I think it it's the one film that never really gained an international reputation. And of course, it's interesting that the film is included in these later collection and there have been a remastered uh, 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 edition that went all around. So I'm, I'm curious about for all of you who, who you know, kind of came to Wong Kar Wai internationally, why is Days of Being Wild not as friendly uh, a film as the other? Um, and do you think it will have an afterlife um, with, all, with the kind of restoration um, efforts? Uh, can I say something about this as a non-film scholar? Um, my personal sense is that you don't, you don't, as 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 an American who has visited Hong Kong several times but doesn't know it well, um, you know, I like to be transported to the places that that Wong Kar Wai takes me. But that Hong Kong doesn't seem like the Hong Kong of my imagination. Um, I, am I am I am I misremembering the film? But I feel like it it has it takes place in a slightly more I don't want to say suburban environment because it's not that, but it's it, you're not in the alley, you're not in the tight alleyways, right? You're not like in in the mood for love or Chunking Express. It, it's you're very the streets are empty, and I I mean I I've, the few days I've spent in Hong Kong, I've never seen an empty street. Um, it, it's it's a it's a kind of a, a urban desert landscape. That's part of it for me. I, you have to go back to nineteen. You have to go back to 1961. And ironically, um, I think a lot of Days of Being Wild was filmed on location. They were able to eke out cor street corners, whereas uh, In the Mood for Love was filmed in Southeast Asia entirely. Yeah. So it's, there's no reality in that Hong Kong no, <laughs> in no, contemporary no. way. All, but it is, all, all that's my interesting. Fantasy, my imagination. Right, that's, that's interesting. In picture. Right, right. Days of Being Wild was shot in the mid, in mid levels in Hong, on, on Hong Kong Island. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and and so the location is it, still there. You still um, see, uh, right? But even central Hong Kong was uh, was uh, hardly the uh, teeming masses. Uh, like certain neighborhoods were, of course, but uh, the uh, middle class, you know, of which he is, uh, Yadi. But so I mean, I was amazed when I saw the uh, the cafe MPNGI films. Uh, made in 59, 60, 61. I mean, Hong Kong was, uh, you know, it looked like uh, uh, Peoria. I mean, it just had these, you know, these 
four lane streets, four cars, big houses. Like the Riviera. Uh, yeah, like the Riviera, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was, you know, to try and capture that element, which, of course, by when he releases it in 1990, uh, very few people of the, his generation are going to remember the 1960, you know. But when I watched the, uh, uh, the Mandarin films of MP and GI, I saw it with a bunch of... <laughs> I wasn't so old in those days. Uh, but the old the old people were just going wild at, at uh, you know with nostalgia for the mm -hmm. Hong Kong of their youth. Mm -hmm. I think but Helen. Also, yeah. If I may interject, I think uh, there's con there's a, a large consensus that it's a great film. Um. So, but I live in Hong Kong, so maybe I'm you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's possible that it's too early that it missed out on a couple of passages that made it more canonical than it ought to be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but from here, <laughs> there's no question that it's a great mm -hmm. film. It's mm -hmm. his first great film, but it's also one of his very greatest films. And, and of course, as you know, uh, the presence of Leslie Chung adds, you know, uh, a poignant and also almost a cultish element mm -hmm. and dimension to it. And that's fairly local, but still uh, beyond that, uh, everybody here agrees with you that it is indeed a great film. <laughs> but I've never, you know, I've never really, yeah, I wouldn't know how to answer your question, I'm afraid, right. because because I've been here 15 years and sort of a... Yeah. Because, uh, like, for me, it really exemplified that uh, I think either Joe or David referred to it as the contested relationship that Wang Kawai had, or maybe it was Joe Joe has with, with audience, because with that film... That film was in some way so hated by mainstream audience and so loved by critics. But even mainstream audience, everybody knows that line about the one minute film, you know, look at it's three o'clock people. There are Stephen Chow films that make fun of that line as well. So it's really kind of deep in the consciousness. Um, right. It's interesting. But, it's now revived now. Uh, usually it's, it, it's sometimes screened to commemorate the death of Leslie mm -hmm. uh, in April. Well, and, I, uh, oh, Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I will actually go on record to say that Days of Being Wild <laughs> is my favorite Wong Kar Wai film. <laughs> Even though the first one that I saw was In the Mood for Love, I thought that was my favorite. But then uh, <laughs> several years later, you know, and then, then I saw Days of Being Wild, and then several years later, I actually came to the epiphany that that <laughs> was actually my favorite film. But I do uh, I do also wonder why, you know, Chongqing Express, as we said, you know, because it was so championed by uh, Quentin Tarantino, it became the very first Wong Kar Wai film to be promoted to the American audience. And then from that point on, Wong Kar Wai became the author, right? Um, uh, so I wonder, you know, why a film like, or not a film like, but Days of Being Wild was not picked up uh, by a Western uh, taste, uh, what do you call it, uh, a taste setter or, or influencer, right? Um, you know, and that actually raises a question maybe uh, uh, specifically for Helen. I'm curious to hear uh, you and what other people might have to say to that, because with In the Mood for Love here, uh, compared to his previous films, uh, you see a very distinct transition, which is, uh, you know, it, I wouldn't say excessive yet, but it's very uh, heavy-handed stylization in the mood for it was in the mood for love, right? And that somewhat comes at a uh, at a price, right? And the price is not to be uh, critical here, but the price is uh, you know how do we perceive Maggie Chang's character mm -hmm. who transformed from. Uh, Su Li Zhen in Days of Being Wild. Now she has the same name, but the character looks completely different. The body language is completely different, right? But it's supposed to be, they, they, they share the same name. So there is some kind of, uh, uh, you know, subjunctive continuity between Days of Being Wild and In the Mood for Love, these two characters. Two characters. But because of the stylization of In the Mood for Love and uh, her character is essentially doing the Chang Sam or Qi Pao parade throughout the entire film, right? And the cut of the Chang Sam, and what I think Wang Kao Wai said in one of the interviews is that uh, the fabric for one of the, uh, for one of the 
uh, Chang Sam was actually sourced from uh, Bruno's errors when they were doing Happy Together there. And uh, so in other words, you know, from the Western perspective, what is seen as something quintessentially uh, mm -hmm. 1960s Chinese uh, femininity uh, is actually a product of this kind of global uh, sourcing of the mm -hmm. fabric, even the cut itself is not really in the 1960s, you know, because there were a lot of 1960s Cantonese films made in Hong Kong, uh, the characters, female characters wearing Chang Sam, the cut is a lot less fitting. Right. Um, so, you know, my question, you know, I, so I know why in the mood for love can be mm -hmm. such a huge success because in a certain ways it is eroticization and objectivization of the female character. If we mm -hmm. know our Laura Mulvey, right, that, <laughs> that would be the, the kind of critique. Um, but at the same time, the film is so mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. So uh, in some ways, I want to, I want to hear what people, people thoughts on this, you know, the aestheticization, stylization on the one hand, on the other hand, the price it comes at. Can I answer just before Helen? I know we'll have a much a much more expansive and intelligent answer. But the two things that I want to say in answer to your question quickly was that a uh, for Days of Being Wild uh, versus uh, Chunking Express, uh, the simple fact of the matter is I think that Quentin Tarantino saw Chunking Express uh, and went crazy over it and hadn't yet seen <laughs> Days of Being Wild. Uh -huh. So I don't know if he would have had if he would have had the same reaction to Days of Being Wild, which I think for a Westerner uh, is much more mystifying. Uh, people might not even understand the difference between Cantonese and Shanghainese that's spoken in the film uh, and, and things like that. Not to mention, as I said, you know, Leslie Chung is as an icon. So I think uh, Days of Being Wild may be more mystifying and has no nostalgic value for the West just yet or at all. Uh, so, but I think mainly that Chunking Express, in a in a happy way, I guess, fits into a modern uh, a model uh, of an art cinema in some ways more easily uh, accessible. Which brings me to to uh, uh, in the mood for love, which was not only a fetishization uh, of Maggie Chung uh, and the Chung Sam, uh, but also a fetishization of a moment in the art cinema. Uh, in which Wang's long takes had gotten longer uh, and there was much less dialogue and much less plot. Uh, and so it could be, uh, uh, I mean, the, the box, let me say this, the box office in the U.S. is not impressive for either of those films. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a relative audience, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Chunking Express made less than, uh, less than a million dollars in the U.S., uh, and even in the mood for love, did not not more than two and a half million. But at, on the level at which it was consumed, I think it was this was the art cinema breakthrough. Uh, mm -hmm. And so not only did you have these wonderful exotic uh, dresses, uh, and of course the beautiful Maggie Chung, uh, but also it looked much more like an art film, so to speak, uh, than any of the others. Uh, and, and on that level, and I'll give it over to Helen. Even Happy Together had done better uh, than Chunking Express because it also had a level at which it could be consumed, mm -hmm. which I don't think Days of Being Wild had. There was no way to get in it for a Westerner at that time without auteurship, which of course mm -hmm. you wouldn't have had with one or two films. I, I want to jump in here uh, just because I want to make sure that we give the audience a chance to answer oh, some questions. We only have about, 50, about yeah, 10 or 12 minutes left. <laughs> so Keith, do we have some questions? I know oh, we do. Sorry. Um, no, it's okay. This is great. Um, we do have a couple of questions, and my chat function is freezing on me, so I will give the last question that has been put in there, and then I'm going to get back to some earlier ones. Time permitting, and a reminder to, uh, as panelists, if you guys want to go to the YouTube link that you have to this discussion and even reference anyone who didn't get an answer to their question in the comments. But don't do it now, otherwise you'll get an echo, which I discovered. Exactly. But yes, but yeah, uh, after we're done with this, uh, you can, uh, those folks will definitely see their response. But this question at hand for y'all, 
says, I have always been fascinated by the themes of nostalgia, connections, and expiration in Wong Kar Wai's films pre and post Hong Kong handover. Ultimately, what I see is the evolving Hong Kong identity through characters' own struggles. In considering the current political climate in Hong Kong, how do you think this changes or enhances the way we look or should look at these themes in those films? And this comes to us from viewer S. Lee, whoever that may be. It's a great question. Anybody can jump in. Go ahead. Um, so in terms of Hong Kong identity, you know, uh, it's something that I'm also really, I've also really thought a lot about. And also I want to connect that back to the formality of serial or seriality. And I think that can perhaps offer us a way uh, or an angle of understanding what identity is and specifically what the kind of pre post colonial post colonial Hong Kong identity is. That is, you know, it is not an identity in the sort of uh, uh, authenticated uh, uh, original priori sense. Rather, it is this kind of serial process of playing it out, enacting an identity, and by attaching it to a location, to a time, to a nostalgic piece. But then all of this has to be played out in this kind of serialized uh, movement of always looking for an identity, right? Always looking for an identity and uh, and that identity is always already ad hoc in some ways. It's not, um, you know, it's a discursive effect to put it more sort of, uh, uh, in, a, in a nutshell. I, um, I have one interesting, I, I was thinking of the work of my colleague Audrey Yu, who approaches Wong Kar Wai's film from a kind of Sinophone perspective, and she has a piece um, that that looks at how, Sinophone, uh, how Wong Kar Wai actually creates a kind of mapping of Hong Kong that also belongs to diasporic communities in Southeast Asia. So you, you also see Singapore, you see the Philippines, um, you see a kind of Hong Kong that isn't necessarily just, you know, part of China or a Chinese city, but but to see Hong Kong like maybe belonging more to part of a Southeast Asia kind of landscape. And I think that's also an interesting take that maybe in today's kind of climate um, with a kind of disidentification with either the British past or the Chinese present or future, um, that Wong Kar Wai film might provide a kind of different kind of identification. Um, so that makes it more interesting than just kind of nostalgic for a lost past. Um, so, so I think that might be an interesting angle to look at. Because um, my blind spot is I think of Wong Kar Wai as a Hong Kong filmmaker, right? And sometimes maybe internationally he's seen as a Chinese filmmaker. Um, but to, to not to overlook that Southeast Asian connection, I think it's an interesting approach as well. Actually, real quick, may, I just, uh, if I may amplify, oh, sorry. Can I, sorry, uh, Giorgio, real quickly. Just though. amplifying briefly uh, Helen's yeah. point, uh, you know, uh, that to take that even further, perhaps we can also, not to the exclusion of the other perspectives, of course, we can also think of Hong Kong as a free port, mm -hmm. uh, beating to the pulse of alternating vernacular and cosmopolitan tendencies. So that's, mm -hmm. And, and, and by broader circle, and which Hong Kong un, undoubtedly also is. So it's all of these things. And so, but it's a great question. It's, you know, very, the answer would have, would have to be layered or, uh, you know, multi multifaceted. It, it seems that the characters in, in Wong Kar Wai's films are always traveling to other port cities. And I'm wondering, I mean, whether they're going to Singapore or if I'm not mistaken, Taiwan, um, Shanghai, but but do they do any characters in a Wong Kai film travel anywhere else other than Shanghai in the mainland? Angkor Wat, Angkor Wat, but but not in but mainland China, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> ashes of, in ashes of time, they are in China. They're in the mainland. <laughs> 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 martial yeah. arts, uh, Jianghu, <laughs> yeah, and Jiang Grandmaster, Jiang. of course, Grandmaster. Grandma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in uh, Guangzhou. Guangzhou, right. <laughs> Which is a suburb of Shanghai, no? <laughs> well, yes, in yes. Blueberry Nights, uh, you know, the film is oh, set in New York. Sort of... That's right, that's right. Sorry, I deleted that. I forgot about that. <laughs> well, I <don't> know. <laughs> and I I'm haven't seen a couple Calvin of here. I'm thinking of invisible cities. I'm thinking of a geography of the imagination, right? That sort of uh, um, seems to replicate itself. Um, 
and 2046 <laughs> when he when he made the film it's sorry it's my cat um when he made the film it was an illusion uh, and kind of like an expression of the anxiety with 2046 right 50 years uh, away but in many ways 2040 2046 is is now with hong kong is already in hong kong right I think, you know, if we're thinking about Hong Kong identity and how Wong Kar Wai's films are still speaking uh, to Hong Kong identity at this point, yes, of course, I think it's even more urgent than before. Keith, what do you have? Have you got your chat box functioning? I do. Uh, this is directed at uh, Giorgio but I think everyone might be able to speak on it too as well. But uh, this, there is a question about the re-release of the films with, it, with in regards to a change in its aspect ratio. Curious yeah. to know what was to be achieved by this and did it? Um, I, I, I refer to Fallen Angels. Uh, uh, the box set comes with the brochure and I think there's a statement by Wong Kar Wai where he, uh, he talks about how uh, on, on editing Fallen Angels, he dreamt, you know, he, he, he wished he, he had been able to show it through an anamorphic lens in, you know, in a, in, in a widescreen format, uh, which, which he couldn't, given the limitations of the time. And, and uh, in this statement that comes with the, with, the, with the new release, he says that finally technology allows him to actually realize that dream of releasing Fallen Angels uh, in a widescreen format. And that's what you see in, in, in the new, you know, and I've seen it, I've taken a look at it. Um, uh, it makes the film rather different because it engulfs the character in, a, in an environment which is now a lot, looks and feels a lot larger uh, than in the original film. Uh, in the original film, the characters come across as um, almost suffocated uh, in the frame, particularly in those extreme close-ups in the mm -hmm. ground. In this new version, the effect is very different. Uh, so well worth watching. Uh, is it better? Why did it do it? Um, you know, that those are interesting questions. Um, it looks splendid, um, um, but uh, I think the question of whether it's an improvement or a restoration, let alone a restoration, is certainly um, open. Okay, um, let's see, one more question. Uh, this comes from Jasmine. Uh, she asked, what do you think about the way Wong Kar Wai shows the Deja Disparu in his 60s trilogy? Where is Akba? <laughs> <laughs> it's Akba's term. He has to answer the question. <laughs> um, what is okay. the Dejadis Peru? Yeah, I guess that is the bigger question. <laughs> 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 I was I was looking that up myself, and I was like, "This seems very much out of my wheelhouse." But <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, it was it was the notion that it was already it was as soon as you uh, as soon as you captured it, it was already gone, and it was in the process of being gone, and that was uh, uh, and Wong was uh, absolutely right. I mean, you talked about twenty forty six, which I don't think is especially good film necessarily, but. He certainly had a he certainly had a lot of a a lot of key key notions there, and even as I tried to <laughs> go quickly over uh, be, from 1994 when he made Chongqing Express, uh, the stuff half the stuff's already gone. Let me just say very quickly, my sense of Hong Kong has always been that it was a deja disparu that Hong Kong, unlike a lot of other places, including the mainland, doesn't really didn't. I, don't, I shouldn't say this, but there, there was always something new in Hong Kong. They were tearing down and putting up, tearing down and building up. Uh, and so it was always, it was always uh, hustle and bustle and new. Uh, and then what was going to happen to Hong Kong, Wong wondered, when, when something really new <laughs> happened, such as a new, a new master. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, you must see Wong's films. Uh, the 60s were already gone. But even now, the 90s are gone. This is my feeling. Pessimist that I am. That's a really somber note to end on. So No, I don't want to end on it. <laughs> go to Joe. Go to Joe. Go to Joe. <laughs> Why? Is Joe any less? <laughs> 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 
hard not to be nostalgic under the current political circumstances, but yeah. Um, well, at stake is actually Hong Kong itself, according to a lot of people. So it's not just a period or a moment, but it's actually the its integrity as a place, its sense of itself as a place, as a distinctive place. I think that's too pessimistic a, a take, but I, that's for a lot of people. That's what is that's what's at stake now. So it's uh, so it's a it's yeah it's a it's a very it's a great question. Are the kids who are who are you know mar were marching in the streets and 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 whatnot? Um, are they are they are they watching Wong Kar Wai? <laughs> no, no, no. That was a missed encounter. It never happened. Okay. <laughs> my, I, in, China, in China, they, they you know uh, because there's a cinephile culture, a very strong. Of course, Wong Kar Wai is adored, but you know uh, by a large enough, you know it's a big place. So. Uh, but a lot less here. Taiwan and Japan, those are very important uh, areas that have shaped the reception of Wong Kar Wai. Southeast Asia, as Elena mentioned, but also. And in Japan, I think uh, he's, he's a, a, a dominant figure uh, among not only cinephiles, but in, in, in Japanese film culture in general. So that's, that's very interesting. Uh, and it's something that I'd like to do more on. Yeah. And also feel like the aesthetic and the sentiment seems to me very maybe 90s and 80s, right? Like very the immediate post-colonial period, which is tied much more to a nostalgia of, you know, those time when Hong Kong was a leading port city, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas I think now with young people, especially is a very different sentiment. I think, I actually think they dis disidentify with that past as well. Um, and, and the cinema like seems to be, there's a lot more local, low budget indie film that they would embrace, which kind of surprised people from my era, right? We're used to the Wong Kar Wai kind of indie aesthetic that is framed in mainstream, you know, in the mainstream world. Whereas now I think there's a truly grassroots indie cinema that young people actually embrace in Hong Kong. Yeah. And that's very interesting, but that the aesthetic and the sentiments very different from Wong Kar Wai. Um, Can I say something uh, a bit provocative? Uh, I don't think Hong Kong, uh, Hong, Hong Kong doesn't care about Wong Kar Wai, but I don't think Wong Kar Wai cares about Hong Kong, not anymore. An event like the one you are doing in Denver, I don't, mm -hmm. I've, I haven't heard it, uh, anything like that is being scheduled here. Uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> uh, so let's see how this plays out. But you know, there's no- That's why we put it on the internet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's, uh, but see, again, it goes back to what David also said. It's, it's changing mm -hmm. constantly. You know there are immaterial, no material changes in the in the media scape, in the cultural, you know, a sphere, which are you know amazing. The speed and the and the scope, the velocity of the of the changes is something we cannot keep track of. Mm. And it's the sort uh, of city. I'm also in uh, thinking back to the question in terms of the uh, disparu and. Uh, you know, it seems to me that in the 60s trilogy that was uh, created in the 1990s, right? And many people here say that the 60s were already gone. And then the fact that he had to film the uh, exterior of In the Mood for Love, mostly in Bangkok, is an indication that the kind of the Hong Kong look is no longer in Hong Kong. Somehow it's translated or translocated uh, to Bangkok, right? That itself, the kind of place swapping itself is also really interesting. But then I think thinking about what was disappearing in Wong Kar Wai's imaginary, right? It's really not about 19, 1990s Hong Kong, or it is about that, but then it's sort of refracted through this kind of a memory work or the work of uh, hanging on to the 1960s. 60s. So what was disappearing in his imaginary was not only the 1960s Hong Kong, but also the um, diasporic Shanghainese community in Hong Kong, right? And he was talking about, in many of his interviews, he talked about how his parents' generation who, uh, who sort of like were exiled to Hong Kong after the war, and by the 60s, they were aging that community, the Shanghai di diasporic community uh, was kind of you know, being, uh, was disappearing, right? So there is this kind of layers of disappearance that was built into the texture of uh, Wong Kar Wai's 1960s trilogy. And that was, uh, that was then sort of uh, articulated with the 1990s um, post-colonial, pre-post-colonial 
uh, anxiety, right? So I think that there, there, there is a kind of a very specific historical conjuncture that led to uh, the importance of, of the, his set of films. I mean, the politics has turned somersault on itself in some ways. And I actually would be really curious to know what Hong Kong, what Wong Kar Wai would think in terms of what is it, what is it, what is disappearing now, and what is the the thing that's keeping on disappearing that he would like to filmically address. Well, I have the unfortunate task of letting everyone know that our time is uh, déjà desperu, <laughs> and uh, we we're out of time, but. Um, this has been really enlightening for me and I've really appreciated and enjoyed all of your comments. So thank you again to all of you for participating uh, in this discussion. And if you, and for those of you who are still with us, if you haven't checked out the, uh, the world of Wong Kar Wai on Denver Films virtual cinema platform, please do. Uh, um, and I think it's up Keith for how much longer? Um, it runs through uh, March 4th on Great. our uh, event a platform which you can find and, at denverfilm.org and i forgot to make a pitch for DeFi as well the the humanity center that organized <laughs> help organize and co-sponsor so if you if you're still with us and you enjoyed this conversation check us out at dphi.org we have lots of conversations of this nature many on film in fact as well so cool thank you guys really appreciate it thank you for inviting thank you thank you, thank you.